I think we're all set up here. I'm just going to turn it over because we don't have a lot of time to our great presenter, Jim. Jim, it was so fascinating listening to the project in Salem, a town I grew up in before middle school, Portland and Salem. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to you and please uh, take us away. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I always like to know who's in the room, but I also don't want to use time on my needs. I want to, I want to use it for, you know, for your needs. But um, I just wonder if you could just give me a little bit, maybe just by raising your hand or using one of the icons, um, how familiar are you with, um, with collective impact? Like maybe just if you're, if you feel like you're really familiar you, you know the five conditions of collective impact, that sort of thing, and I give a, a thumbs up. If you're if a somewhat, you know, maybe this way, and if you don't know hardly anything about it, maybe like a thumbs down. I, I, I get it in your screen. So I'm seeing a kind of a mixture of folks. I'm only seeing a couple people that feel like they're real familiar with collective impact. So there's, there's no thumbs down option, but I'm a beginner right here. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, you, you know, the, the, I'll just very briefly talk about the, these five conditions of collective impact, and I may not name them right. I'm not like an expert on collective impact. I just have worked with it for several years now. And the idea that it starts with some side of a, a common agenda, we used our vision to say, you know, and our vision was that every child in every neighborhood grows up in a safe, stable, nurturing home, enjoys good health, succeeds at school, and goes on in life to become financially self-sufficient. And we developed that vision with input from over 200 neighborhood residents. Um, and it took a while, you know, to get language that we ended up with like that thumbs up kind of a thing, everybody going, yes. So that's our common agenda, that every child grows up in a safe, stable, nurturing home, that they enjoy good health, they succeed in school, and they go on in life to become financially self-sufficient. And from there, you know, we looked at, well, how do we get common measures? And we we've developed six measures. I'm not gonna take a lot of time to go into them, but we wanna have the lowest child maltreatment rates in the nation. That was one of ours. That we want to uh, eliminate childhood family homelessness in our community, one neighborhood at a time. We uh, want to, we're so lucky to have this integrated care for kids grant because what they've seen is if, if there's one thing to kind of focus on, it might be chronic absenteeism, either in preschools or in elementary schools, because those kids who are chronically absent oftentimes are kids who are experiencing neglect or abuse. They're kids who are having serious complicated health issues. They're kids who are homeless. And so we, we want to really promote um, a very high level of regular attendance in preschools and at in, in the elementary schools. Um, I think I already mentioned, we want to eliminate unnecessary emergency room visits in hospital um, stays. Um, am I forgetting? The schools have asked us to, they wanted an indicator that there's a reduction in disruptive behavior in the, in the classroom. So again, those came out of lots of conversations with uh, families and about what would be the indicators our that we're moving towards our vision by building community resilience that strengthens families and supports world-class education. The, the, the next condition of collective impact is coordinated and aligned support and services. So when you put together a group of folks, who do you need at the table to coordinate and align their support and services under one kind of like a comprehensive plan? It takes constant communication. This is probably some of the hardest uh, Part of it is the, is the communication and then what they call a collective impact backbone organization. And, you know, um, I was the executive director at Catholic Community Services before I, I went to work for the community business and education leaders. And one of the reasons was we were good at raising funds. You know, um, when I started there, we were raising uh, about $750,000 a year. And when I left, it was up to 20 million. 
And so you need an organization because these things take resources. They take trust, first of all, um, and they take all of those conditions, but your backbone organization, they have to, in my view, they have to be able to bring resources to the table uh, or, or people just can't afford to hang in there. Collective impact is expensive. So I'm gonna stop there and just with that very quick overview of uh, collective impact and just see if, if someone either has a question or um, if there's some example in that, that, that you would be willing to share with us about a struggle with collective impact or success of collective impact, I, I really do believe that it, your willingness to share here with others in this time will be helpful you know, for, for everyone. So is there someone that has a question or an example that they would like to share? Yes, Allison. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I really loved your presentation. Um, and one of the things that really impressed me about it is the scale of the work. Um, I guess this is a question about scale. Um, so I'm part of leading um, a cradle to career initiative in uh, part of our community called Live Oak. And we have a really robust parent engagement, parent leadership, family engagement component to that. Um, and what, what's been hard to kind of imagine is how we take that really authentic grassroots community organizing model and bring it to scale. Um, you know, without, because the way we have it is we have like a parent leadership committee at each school and then they each elect two representatives to join our steering committee. And this is just for one part of our county. And, and so what does it look like for us to sort of begin imagine growing that within the district involving other districts and, and I see that you kind of have that really great framework for how you're maintaining your roots you know and really being responsive to the community's voice and including them um, so I guess I just wanted to hear a little bit more about your journey and coming bringing it to the work to scale you know one of the things that I didn't mention when we first started this work we had 1,300 kids in foster care in Marion County, and we, we brought that number down to 580, almost a 50% reduction, but not one dollar, you know, that we, we estimated we saved six million dollars in foster care, play, and we did that safely and equitably. But not one dollar stayed in our communities to help, and uh, it was all with grants, that sort of thing, no sustainable funding. And as that funding went away, the, the number of kids going, experiencing maltreatment and going into foster care went up. And so part of, this is why policy is so important and family first, um, our state has accepted family first as a, as a way bringing the, you know, bringing people in leadership together. One of the reasons that we really looked at like the, the community business and education leaders collaborative, these folks who have a voice and are willing to hear what their neighbors in these neighborhoods need and then to advocate for both at philanthropy, but even more importantly at the policy level so that as we start to see benefits in communities that save money, that money can be invested in scaling up the effort. And I don't wanna overstate our effectiveness of that, but I can just tell you I have more hope that that's happening than ever. Um, our local hospitals are saying, for sure, if you can cut down emergency room visits and unnecessary stays in the hospital, you bet, we will, we will share that savings with you because we, we benefit greatly by our own measures of success. Um, the schools are saying, yes, if, if you can reduce chronic absenteeism um, and have more kids showing up here, it, it, will, it will lead to us investing and wanting to scale that up in more neighborhoods. But, but I think it's really important to move from program level results to population level results. You, showing that a program is good is wonderful, but when you show that you, you've actually moved the needle with a population, and so taking elementary school service boundaries as your neighborhood, I think, and then really advocating that all of the various organizations start to report their data by neighborhood so that you have a baseline and you can actually tell if things are changing. Um, you can see if, 
if you're getting population, population level results at the neighborhood level, that excites people. Everyone knows there's great programs out there. And if you're lucky enough to get in that program, you're going to do well. But that doesn't motivate systems change. That just gets people to invest more in that program. I, I hope that's helpful. I hope that's a helpful response. Thank you. Someone else have a, a comment about your own experience? And, and your experience, I'm sure, is just as valuable or more than mine or a question for me. Can you be willing to share an experience or a question with Collective Impact? Mine isn't really about collective impact, but I love this whole idea. But I know uh, I'm an early education person, and I know exactly what you're saying about absenteeism. When we look at that, we have to start looking at what else does this family need. There's, and I I can say that we we do referrals to other agencies and all that kind of stuff to help the families. But I would love to have a network so we can really move this all forward for everyone to succeed. Yes, yes. And it's, it's sort of amazing when you, I mean, it, it is so frustrating, at least it has been for us, because people are so used to the way we talk about sometimes is swimming in their own lane. And you know, you're swimming as hard as you can in your own lane. And that's appropriate sometimes, you know, educators need to educate, healthcare providers need to do healthcare. But there is a place where we got to be willing to invite people to get out of their lane and to sort of surround uh, families. And the other part of it is, for us, is, is really how do you find people that live in the neighborhood that want to be a part? It, it, you know, if you think about adverse community environments. For me, there's the, th the three key strengthening families protective factors that, that the, the, the opportunity to have positive social connections, that's absolutely more important than anything else, positive social connections. And then the second thing is that, that opportunity to, to have tangible support in times of need. And lots of times it, it isn't very expensive kinds of stuff that will bring people to the table. Um, and that's what their need for something tangible oftentimes will bring folks who don't feel a part of the community to the, to the table. And then new knowledge and skills that help them with whatever it is they want help with. We keep wanting people, we want to tell people what they need help with, but, and, and usually it's child development and parenting skills, right? Um, it has something to do with learning how to cook, uh, so you're, or how to shop. So it's what we want them to do. But I've just found if you just listen and hear what people want to learn, they know more what they need than we do. And then people coming together. So we've got what we now call the Community Resource Network. And they're totally focused on any tangible need anybody has. We have hundreds of people who are saying, I'll look at my computer every day. And if somebody needs something, I'll get it to them. If, if, it's, if I've got it in my garage, they get it. And we've got... Um, you, you saw in the, the video about how folks are out in the community inviting folks to come to community cafe meetings. And for, that's an opportunity for positive social connections. But from there, they look at, well, what, where else could we have a positive social connection? And so we got a group of moms who say, well, I would like to walk my kids to school. Uh, of course, we're all out of school now. With, but, but, and they got another group who say, well, I would like to have a walking group. Well, it rains almost every day in Oregon. So finding a church that they can open it up and their kids can play in the middle of the gym and the moms are walking around. Those, those things are just leading and they don't cost hardly anything. Um, so that, you know, having, having a theory of change that's grounded in credible science and then asking yourself as as a group, what could we do and not be focused so much on, or not be focused completely on all of the barriers about what we can do. Sometimes very small things really start to make a difference. Uh, su nothing succeeds like success. Thank you for sharing that, Kathy. Somebody else, do we have time, David, for another comment or question? Uh, yeah, we do. We're supposed to break at 
135, so we actually have about eight minutes, I guess. Any other comments or questions? I'd love to hear somebody about somebody else's work. Um, so one of the things we're working on in, in Santa Cruz County is um, revitalizing our Child Abuse Prevention Council as part of our children's network. And um, we have a broad array of professionals um, represented there um, who already acknowledge that they have um, sort of this shared vision or could have a shared impact, a collective impact. Um, but we're really at the just this sort of cusp of what's next. Now we, we agree, we matter, we need to all be present, but we're all fully busy with our own responsibilities and we're missing, we're still missing that neighborhood family component. Um, different agencies might be working with them, but we don't have them in this, in this forum yet. What, what should we do first? Your meeting already, correct? Yes. So you're, you're developing social connections among yourself. I, I have found we need the same thing that the families need. We need positive social connections and to develop uh, trust with one another. And so having like a community cafe style meeting where you have a short presentation and then opportunities for people to bring their own ideas about what's needed to the table. And then as you look at all of those ideas, but what are, which of these would actually move the needle a little, even if it's just a little bit and that we can, that we can do. And then look at, well, what, what would we like to do if we just had the resources to do it? And what I have found is once people start doing what they can, so they're, they're moving and they, they start, there's agreement. If you get four or five agencies to agree, this is what we would do next. The, the money will, you got to find some, you, you got to have a member who's got a grant writer or you got to find a donor who will say, um, I'll, I'll provide, you know, $1,500, $5,000. That's a very small ask um, to, to be able to contract with a grant writer because you have to build trust. Um, and then you, the, the, the backbone, whoever's doing that, they have to be able to bring new resources to the table. Um, but if you build trust, people will start getting out of their lane. How can we do this together? What can we do right now? And um, I'm, going, I'm going on too much. Does that make some sense? Thank you. Thank you very much. Jim, there was actually a question in the chat. Um, for the work in Oregon, was the local managed care plan involved? Yes. We call that the, the CCO, uh, the Coordinated Care Organization. It, it's a group in our community called Pacific Source. They have been one of the first ones that were willing to move to give us data by neighborhood. And that was the first thing we asked for. Everybody collects data by zip code or by the county. And if you're going to have neighborhood community cafe meetings, people need to see the data in their neighborhood. Um, so th they were very willing to do that. They had that um, capability. And then once they, you know, our theory of change, that safe, stable, nurturing relationships are the key malleable social determinant, that toxic stress is the big thing that gets in the way. And toxic stress has, it's a it's like a stress cocktail. It starts with vulnerability anxiety from the parents own adverse childhood experiences and trauma that's never been dealt with. Um, and it, it includes competence anxiety because vulnerability anxiety oftentimes leads to not succeeding in school. And so you don't have competence to, to deal with the challenges of life. And then those two things add up to having poverty. So if, if you've got vulnerability anxiety, you've got competency anxiety, and you've got financial anxiety, you're, you're set up for toxic stress. So those are the pieces that have to be addressed. And then looking at a model where we are promoting these three key strengthening family protectors, family, strengthening family protective factors in the homes and neighborhoods, and, you know, there's five actually, but the three that in my experience that you have to focus on are positive social connections, tangible support in times of need and new knowledge and skills. And you've got to, you've got to put that into a trauma informed 
Because if you just do what everybody's been doing, people won't feel safe there and so they won't come. The only thing they'll come for is the tangible support. But if you, if you make the education safe and you uh, make the relationships safe, people want that, they're hungry for it and they will stay and then there will be growth. Well, that theory of change works. I mean, I showed you that graph, it works. And when we present that with a, a theory of change grounded in credible science, our CCO is now providing 200, and, I think it's $250,000 a year in support to the Fostering Hope Initiative. And they've committed to helping us scale that up. So, um, and what, you know, they all have their own, um, what do they call it, consumer or customer advisory groups. And th those customer advisory groups love this theory of change, in my experience. They, they hear it, they, it resonates with them, they know that it makes sense. And so, so being able to speak with your um, customer advisory groups or your, in, inside of your health organizations, in our experience, this, you know, we're talking their language. We're not talking about, in, in my experience, families do not want to be, they don't even want you to talk about prevention because what are you preventing? You're preventing, you're trying to prevent them from hurting their kids. And they just, it just makes them sick to their stomach that that's okay. I've got to admit that I'm a danger to my kids. But when you come in and you talk about, you know, we want to build community resilience that strengthens families and supports world-class education in your neighborhood and we need your help you need my help. <laughs> you know, we're not, a, we're not trying to prevent anything. We will prevent all of those bad things, but that's not what we're talking about. Um, we're talking about building something here and we need your help. And it's a wonderful thing. It's a glorious thing that we're building. It's, um, and it's, so that language is finding the language it gets people excited and feeling like they want to belong before a court or a caseworker or somebody else tells them they have to. That's really important as well. And people are starting to listen to families. If you've got these, you know, first of all, most folks can't get a meaningful feedback from the people that you'll not want to serve. And when you can, people listen. These are, these are just great remarks, Jim. I see a lot of nodding and yes in the chats. Um, they touch on, you know, core concepts of appropriate adolescent youth development, understanding the youth that we support as the assets that they are, who we desperately need to engage with us to build the community that we want. And then that, you know, per your comments, it just goes right up through the lifespan, right? About how we just, the orientation of the work overall. I saw a speaker years ago, you've probably heard this one. We don't kid, we don't teach kids how to not, how to not drown. We teach them how to swim, right? So that's kind of this, this simple orientation that we need to take to the work. So I, I allowed myself a few comments just as we close out. I think we're at time. Um, so it's 1.35. And so I'm about to post, and let's see if I get this right. In the chat is the link to get back to the main room. So all you should have to do is click on that link and you'll leave this room and go back to the main uh, room. And I will stay here to make sure that everybody gets out successfully, uh, transfers uh, through the cyberverse back to the main room, that the teleporter works. And uh, Jim, you're getting lots of thank you messages in the chat. So again, we couldn't appreciate more uh, you coming and being with us today.